Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. I think we can remove this uh, screen. Uh, I'm Merit Jano, Dean of the School of International and Public Affairs at Columbia University. And it's my enormous pleasure to welcome you to this important launch of the Kent Global Leadership Program on Conflict Resolution. We're truly pleased to have so many of you here with us today from the SEPA community, from the United Nations, NGOs, the private sector, and so many others working on conflict matters around the world. The study of conflict and conflict resolution is a core area of research, training, and engagement at Columbia SEPA, and really has been since our founding in 1946. From the earliest days, our scholars and practitioner experts have focused on great power competition and the use of force, on regional and sub-regional tensions and their sources, on humanitarian crises, interventions and the role of international organizations, on peace building and the United Nations. And increasingly as a leading school of global public policy, the inescapable interconnections that are required to address sources of conflict and achieving progress and driving solutions in the world today. For example, the effects of climate change on crops and movements of people that can lead to conflict, the importance of economic development, sound institutions, functioning systems, all involving multiple stakeholders. We're also a premier school for training future leaders who will go on to address conflict, whether at international organizations, the UN, WHO, or NGOs, working on the front lines or within the private sector. Ours is a school designed around key challenges in the world. And the Kent Global Leadership Program on Conflict Resolution builds on this important legacy and history. It's a program that was made possible through the generosity and importantly, the encouragement and involvement of Mutar Kent, former chairman and CEO of the Coca-Cola Company, a remarkable corporate leader, and we thank him again uh, for prompting us, supporting us to take this bold step. The cornerstone of the program will be a training program at Columbia that will bring together mid-career professionals who are on the front lines to learn and think about conflict in form from multiple vantage points. Our first training will take place this summer and we are grateful to the partner countries and UN missions who've given early indication of their interest and who may be participating and we're building this out at this time. The Kent program will also include a Kent visiting professor, regular convening, including in the coming spring, support for student fellowships and other activities. And I'm pleased to share that our inaugural Kent professor will be Jean-Marie Gaino, former Under Secretary General for Peacekeeping Operations at the UN, and who's previously served as a professor at SEPA. We are excited to be the home of this remarkable program. I want to thank SEPA's Saltzman Professor Ed Luck, an expert in the UN and international affairs, who's the inaugural director of the Kent program and director of our conflict resolution program. Thank you, Ed, for moderating today's discussion. And we have with us a truly remarkable and experienced group of individuals that Professor Luck will introduce. They represent an extraordinary range of experiences at the highest levels of policy, on the ground, in the most difficult settings, in policy setting bodies and organizations, public advocates, and voices of wisdom in the global community. Let me simply add my thanks to each of you for being with us. And now I'm very pleased to invite Mutar Kent to share some thoughts with us before turning to the program. I had um, this notion and idea that uh, perhaps uh, um, I could very marginally improve um, um, the um, uh, event, the solving of conflict or the prevention of conflict around the world because I saw so much of it in the last 10 years uh, as I traveled the world, um, about 50 to 60 countries in, uh, around the world. And I saw increasing 
um, conflict of all kinds. Um, when I speak about conflict, I'm referring to not only political or armed conflict, but also social conflict, uh, educational conflict, religious conflict, urban conflict, economic, financial, business conflict, even family conflict. Um, and obviously, um, whatever is happening to the world, um, conflict is on the rise. Uh, tensions are on the rise. And for the well-being of uh, future generations, we, I, I had a belief that we had to do uh, better than how we've done in the last few decades um, in preventing and, and solving uh, these conflicts. Um, and again, one program uh, at one institution uh, can only go so far. But out of uh, many choices, um, I decided to partner with uh, Columbia, with the SIPA school at Columbia. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, really, really happy I did. Um, and I really look forward um, uh, to this, um, that uh, perhaps this can be a small example um, to others, to, to in motivating others to also to join um, in this. The key variance um, in this program uh, is the use of what I call the golden triangle. Um, the golden triangle of uh, government, business, and civil society uh, coming together, uh, in, uh, coming together in partnership to share their experiences, leaders in, from this golden triangle coming together to share their experiences in how they solved conflict or how they prevented conflict, sharing their experiences with young uh, diplomats from around the world, young civil servants that would offer their uh, civil uh, diplomats to this program and join, and then they would uh, create this, we would create this relationship with the Golden Triangle. And through that, I believe um, this uh, Golden Triangle can uh, positively impact the minds, the, the attitudes of these young future leaders around the world. Uh, the Ken program is intended to facilitate dialogue among, amongst these various groups. It will engage, um, um, members of the Golden Triangle and have them share their experiences firsthand. Um, each session is going to be documented and shared virtually with a much wider group. And I'm really excited to be a catalyst uh, for a program which is, in a way, the first of its kind. Um, um, surely it's not going to be perfect. Surely we'll learn and we will tweak and fine tune as we go along. But um, I just wanted to share with all of you today my excitement about the start of this program and, um, and hopefully um, we will all witness uh, it making um, a small difference in, in helping to prevent or in solving various kinds of conflict uh, around the world. Thank you um, very much for joining us today and I look forward to all your remarks. Thank you. And let me introduce the speakers very quickly in the order in which they're going to be speaking. And as you may know, we're going to have this in five segments, five themes, one led by each of our speakers. These are not the only themes that might be discussed in the larger program, but they're among the themes that we think deserve more attention. Uh, first, we have Lakdar Brahimi, who is a legendary figure in the world of international diplomacy. Uh, Lakdar served as a foreign minister of Algeria. Uh, he was among the founders uh, and a very active participant in the elders. And he has served admirably in many, many mediation efforts for the world. It got particular attention, of course, uh, when he served as the joint special uh, envoy to Syria joint sponsorship by the UN and by the Arab League. Uh, but Lakhdar is the voice of wisdom. And it seems to me that's uh, uh, something that's in short supply these days. Uh, second, we have Sam Nunn. And Sam uh, is known to many of you. He served for 24 years as a senator uh, representing Georgia and as a Democrat, it's an unusual combination these days, uh, but he was known for bipartisanship on any number of arms issues and strategic issues and nuclear issues. Uh, he founded the um, Nuclear Threat Initiative 
which he remains co-chair of. That's a very important group that reaches out around the world to try to reduce nuclear dangers, not only of warfare, but environmental dangers, safety dangers. And we're delighted that he's with us today. Uh, we have David Miliband, who has become one of the world's leading voices in humanitarian affairs. He's president and CEO of the International Rescue Committee, which since the World War II has been working to help ease the burdens of vulnerable populations around the world. Uh, prior to that, he served as Foreign Secretary of the United Kingdom. So we're delighted that David will be with us today. Uh, we're also enormously pleased to have Dina Kewar, who is the Jordanian ambassador to the UN. Uh, I'm sorry, who was the uh, Jordanian ambassador to the UN. That's where I remember her and served on the Security Council and was particularly active in trying to ease humanitarian access to Syria. Uh, she is now the Jordanian ambassador to Washington, which is probably just as challenging as being in New York. So we're delighted that she could be with us in particular because she happens to be a graduate of SIPA, one whom we are very proud of. Uh, and finally, but not least at all, batting cleanup will be Rosemary DiCarlo. Uh, Rosemary had been Deputy Permanent Representative of the United States to the UN. Uh, she was very active in the Security Council on many of these issues. She has now moved across the street to the UN where she is Under Secretary General for Political and Peacebuilding Affairs. That means that uh, Rosemary is in charge of basically everything we're talking about for the UN from conflict prevention to mediation to peace building. So we're enormously pleased to have her with us and she'll talk a bit about partnerships uh, with civil society and uh, with uh, the private sector. I had two questions for you. Uh, one, in the concept paper that I prepared uh, for the program, I suggested there was a stark difference between attitudes in the first decade of this century, which are decidedly optimistic, thinking that norms and institutions are working, and the second decade, which we're now completing, uh, which has been known for, as I think Mutar suggested, growing numbers of forced to place people, uh, more atrocities, and a much harder time trying to resolve conflict. So my first question to you is, is it true that it's become more difficult to resolve conflict internationally? And the second question related to it, what can we do about it? So if you can do all that in five minutes, uh, we're in great shape. So please, Lakdar, you have the floor. Well, I, I mean, I'll make a few comments, not too far from the questions that you have asked, but uh, I mean, you will tell me later how, how good I, how successful I have been. Um, I, I'll, I'll try, I really make two points. The first one is an attempt to answer it, your, your questions. And the second is a list rather than a presentation of the main lessons I think I have learned during the years I have spent uh, dealing with conflict. So the end of the Cold War gave the illusion that world peace as dreamed of the end of the world War, world War II was at long last becoming a reality. The Security Council shared in this optimism and whereas its meetings were few and far between in the days of the Cold War, they started meeting practically every day and whereas resolutions used to be long to draft and even longer to adopt, they became easy to adopt and abundant in number, if not in efficiency. The parties to various conflicts and their sponsors did not want to be left behind. Afghanistan, Cambodia, Namibia, Lebanon, Central African states, Central American states, also an end, or at least what looked like the beginning of an end to their conflicts. It's no con coincidence that uh, Nelson Mandela was released in 1990 and started in cooperation with R.W. de Klerk to dismantle the apartheid regime in South Africa. 
uh, you know, as you know, history does not unfold in neat logical consequence, sequences. It uh, leaves it to historians to make sense of events and create order out of the of, of, often haphazard way in which things happen. The agenda for peace, the agenda for development, the Earth Summit, and the four other international summits, which followed from 1992 to 1996. The magnificent celebration of the end of apartheid in Pretoria all took place in the same period of seven years, during which the genocide in Rwanda was taking place under the helpless eyes of the United Nations and the horrors of Yugoslavia were waiting to culminate in the massacres of Srebrenica under the joint watch of the United Nations and the NATO. UN member states called in very short succession, first for the abolition of the department of uh, the recently created peacekeeping department. And, uh, and that was because of Rwanda and Srebrenica and congratulated Secretary General Kofi Annan after the success in Kosovo, the successes in Kosovo, Timor-Leste, the return of some kind of peace to former Yugoslavia and very successful visit to Baghdad to avert another bombing campaign against the country for, by the US and Britain. That was the time when uh, observers were making encouraging statements about the diminishing numbers of conflicts and the capacity of the international community through the UN in particular, but also through other organizations such as the Organization of African Unity then and the European, uh, uh, and, and the European Union to manage and resolve most, if not all existing conflicts. Here, uh, a brief word about uh, Pax Americana, which gave the measure of its potency with the war to liberate Kuwait from Iraq in 1991, uh, and the announcement of a new world order by US President Bush, the father, but began, began to lose its clout with the invasion and occupation of Iraq in 2003 by President Bush, the son. While the smoke was still rising from the murderous 9-11 terror attacks in downtown New York, the chorus of approval of the UN was joined by the Nobel Prize Committee in Oslo, who awarded their 100th Peace Prize to the United Nations and its Secretary General, because in the words of their chairman, they wished to, uh, they wished in their centenary year to proclaim that the only negotiable route to global peace and cooperation goes by way of the United Nations. But new clouds started to gather again, not in the beginning of the second uh, 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 decade of the, uh, of, of the new century, but as uh, much uh, a bit earlier, 2007, 2008. Um, that, that happened to be the worst time of uh, violence in occupied Iraq. Uh, and the number of conflicts started to go up rather than down again. 10 years later, in November 2018, German Ch Chancellor Angela Merkel said that there were 120 active conflicts in the world uh, by then. Uh, I, I didn't count. I didn't count, the, but 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 still, you know, even if it is half of that number, it's really a huge number. As the UN celebrates its uh, 75th anniversary, and its leaders need to qualify their self-congratulatory statements that world peace has been preserved during all these years. Yes, a catastrophic World War III has been avoided, and that is most welcome but peace for all the world has not been achieved and serious thinking is needed to make the organization and everyone else more active in achieving peace for all. Um, I, I, as you know, I started to be involved with attempts to resolve conflicts at exactly the same the time 
of the end of the Cold War. Uh, I was as optimistic as everyone else. Optimism reaches its peak when one is given a chance to look at Mandela and the clerk, work together, quarrel one day and agree the next, and in the end, raise the new non-racial democratic Republic of South Africa out of the ashes of the apartheid regime. But optimism does struggle to survive as one moves from Zahir to Yemen and from Haiti to Afghanistan, not to speak of Lebanon where I started, and last but not least, Iraq and Syria. I realize now that I learned much along the way, but my superiors, my colleagues and I were not wise enough to fully benefit from our many experiences. Uh, as I look back from my retirement, I see that the most important of all lessons I think I have learned is the fact that the UN and practically every other player go into a conflict situation with a huge deficit in knowledge and understanding of the conflict and the country and the region where that conflict is taking place. More than that, the deficit in knowledge is often compounded with serious misconceptions as a consequence, the mandate is often not crafted well enough and its implementation suffers greatly from that initial uh, ignorance. My second lesson is that we far too often rush into organizing very costly elections when the country is not ready for it. Ignoring the fact that elections divide more than they unite. Equally important, we also rush into a constitution making process far too early in the process, ignoring the fact that constitutions are drafted by people who have uh, a great deal, not a minimum of, of, of confidence in one another. Um, on the op uh, op opposite, we do very little to help a country acquire the instruments necessary for the rule of law. Um, that is the, an effective police force, a functioning judicial system, and decent well-run detention centers. The fourth lesson is that far too often, we bring in far too many foreigners than are uh, needed. And there are far too many UN and other organizations on the ground. There is one organization, and that is the first point I make. One uh, organization particular, that, that I particularly respect and admire, and that is the ICRC. Uh, they, they invariably do a very, very good job with uh, total discretion uh, without us being protected by anybody and in, uh, with, with a lot of success. I invariably got very useful advice from them everywhere I went. And I think your program may find it useful to uh, listen to some of their advice. Thank you very much. That's, you know, I'm sorry, I, I've taken a little bit more than five minutes. Well, it was, it was well worth it. We really appreciate it, very insightful. And I should say, as a small advertisement, you mentioned the ICRC. The first meeting that the program had about a month or two ago was with Peter Maurer, the president of the ICRC. And very good. Uh, he would uh, repeat your, your sense of the worth of what the, their people were doing. So thank you very much for that. Uh, let me go straight to Sam Nunn now. Um, Sam, uh, is going to talk a bit about the systemic and uh, existential threats, because there's a great deal of attention, obviously, on individual crises, but how that relates to the larger geopolitical uh, situation in the world is sometimes overlooked. So Sam, if we could ask you to uh, take the floor. Thank you very much, Ed. Am I unmuted? Yes. Uh, Thank you, Dean, and thank you, Ed, and uh, most of all, thank you, Mutar, for uh, starting this very exciting program. Uh, 
Mutar Kent, of all the American businessmen I know, uh, business women included, um, is respected and known by leaders around the world uh, uh, more than any any American businessman. And I think Mutar not only has brought the generosity to this uh, program, but he will bring tremendous example of diplomacy because in addition to running the Coca-Cola company, I was on the board when he did it so well. He also was the chief diplomat for Coca-Cola globally, and he's got that DNA in his blood. Uh, so Mutar, thank you. Uh, as Ed said, I devote uh, most of my time and I did a, a lot of my time in the U.S. Senate on weapons of mass destruction, east-west relationship with Russia and the United States back then, the Soviet Union and the United States having 90% of the nuclear uh, weapons and 90% of the nuclear material. Obviously, that uh, was an area of great focus. Einstein supposedly said after uh, the developing the, uh, the know-how for the nuclear weapon, um, I'm not absolutely sure said this, but it's a... Uh, it's attributed to him. He said, I know not with what weapons World War III will be fought, but I'm confident World War IV will be fought with sticks and stones. And I think that's a pretty vivid description about the power we have developed. Many, many thousands of times the power in nuclear weapons that was present when Einstein made that statement. I think we have moved in the last several years into a new era of nuclear dangers. We've always had dangers, but why do I say we have moved into a, a new era? Uh, number one is that nuclear weapons are no longer a monopoly of nation states. The know-how to develop a nuclear weapon, crude one, not one that would be mounted on a ballistic missile and fly across the world, but a crude nuclear weapon that could change the course of history by blowing up in a city or a port so forth, shake the confidence of the world. That kind of know-how is uh, readily available. And the long pole in the tent that we have to work on diligently, we have been, but we have to really work even hard on it, is keeping nuclear materials out of the hands of uh, would-be terrorists. Uh, it's not a piece of cake to develop a crude nuclear weapon, but it is achievable. So the nuclear materials have to be protected. Uh, I can talk more about that uh, later, but also I would make the point that we have nine nuclear weapon states now, uh, not just the United States and Soviet Union and Britain and France and China. Uh, India and Pakistan is one of the danger areas of the world that uh, we all need to pay attention to. Uh, another fact that uh, moves us into a new era is the development of cyber and other technologies, but particularly cyber. If we have um, attacks by nation states or even by third parties, which is possible, on command and control and warning systems of any of the nuclear states, it poses a real danger of war by uh, by false warning or by blunder. So that problem, I think, has to be worked by every nuclear weapon state. Uh, the third point is the breakdown in arms control. Uh, I won't even name all the treaties that are now uh, been uh, terminated in the last few years. The uh, last remaining bilateral treaty with the United States and Russia is the New START Treaty. Fortunately, it has um, not been rejected by the Trump administration. It can still be renewed on by February 4th, which I understand uh, President-elect Biden has pledged to do. Of course, we've got the Non-Proliferation Treaty uh, that is signed by so many nations around the world, both countries with nuclear weapons and those without. And that treaty is under great stress and we have not ratified the Comprehensive Threat Ban Treaty. So uh, to say the least, uh, um, has eroded. And then I, I would uh, say the, the other big factor is the absence of strategic nuclear dialogue. In the last several years, um, going back the last 10 years at least, we have treated the nuclear strategic discussions with Russia um, as if they were a reward for good behavior rather than uh, an existential interest of our own country. And I think um, Russia and the United States have a lot of differences, but somehow, some way, our two countries with 90% of the nuclear weapons, 90% of the nuclear materials have to carve out an existential box 
to talk about uh, strategic nuclear uh, risk reduction. And I would also put biological on that list. So the bottom line is that, uh, as I see it, we're in a race between uh, cooperation and catastrophe. And that cooperation has to be uh, with nuclear weapon states as well as those who do not have nuclear weapons. Let me just give you a few priorities and then I'll close out. We can talk about them later if you choose. First of all is to renew the strategic dialogue between the United States and we also must begin a dialogue with, with China. The dialogue with China could begin with a Reagan Gorbachev type statement really by the whole P5, including Britain, France, China, United States, and Russia. And that is a nuclear war cannot be won and therefore must not be fought. Second, I've already mentioned renew new start, which I hope will be done. Third, uh, reestablish the priority that was very uh, much of a priority in the Obama administration <clears throat> of protecting nuclear materials wherever they are, particularly weapon grade materials, but also radiological materials that can make a dirty bomb. Uh, fourth, I would like to see each nuclear weapon state conduct their own fail safe review, looking at all nuclear systems, looking at their vulnerability to cyber, looking at the chances of accident, and do their own internal a review uh, and take action to reduce the chances of accident miscalculation wherever it exists. Uh, then finally, I would say in the longer run, uh, decision time is all important. New technologies are gonna to have to be made to work for us, not against us. But right now we are compressing decision time. If our leaders have four or five minutes or six or seven, you choose it to decide whether a warning is false and whether to launch their weapons before they lose them. Um, that time needs to be increased to 15, 20 minutes, and then to a half hour, and then to an hour, then to a day, and then to a week. Uh, that increase in decision time uh, will make nuclear weapons less relevant. We have to make them less relevant as well as reduce the number. So let me stop right there, Ed, and thank you again for your leadership on this important initiative. Uh, thank you very much, Sam. Very helpful comments and in perspective we don't, don't always hear with this subject. And it seems to me you touched on something that I wanted to uh, uh, ask David Miliband about. So let me sort of segue there. You talked about the decline in support for international norms and dialogue. And I think one can add to that international institutions, international treaties and arrangements. And if I could ask you, David, um, what has happened to cause so much cynicism and so much retreat from the kinds of norms and institutions that were be being built in the 1990s and the first decade of this century. I think Lactor talked about that quite a bit as well, uh, but I think it's very important in the humanitarian area. And is there anything we might do at this point to try to begin to rebuild these sorts of institutions and these kinds of ties? So David, please, you have the floor. Thanks very much, Professor. It's a great honor to be with this extraordinarily distinguished group of speakers and with the audience today. I want to congratulate uh, Mr. Kent for his foresight in uh, endowing this um, center and look forward to the graduates of it coming to work for the International Rescue Committee at some point. Uh, and I'd even suggest that um, the real test of the center will be whether it can help sponsor some of the peace building and peacemaking that is so badly needed around uh, the world. Uh, my perspective is that of someone who's leading a global humanitarian organization focused on the victims of conflict. So we work in war zones, we help internally displaced, uh, we help refugees uh, as well. Uh, what we see to your question directly is a growing age of impunity. I choose that word uh, carefully uh, because of the need to identify the fact that we're living in an age when in too many conflict zones around the world, international law is frankly for suckers. International law is disregarded. International law is considered an optional extra, even a luxury. Uh, 43 children in a coach in Yemen bombed by the Saudi-led coalition. Uh, two IRC staff driving an ambulance in Northwest Syria bombed to death uh, as well. And so uh, this age of impunity seems to me to define the problem. Uh, the, the, some interesting statistics about the changing nature of conflict uh, the five-year rolling average for civilian fatalities in conflict around the world today is 34,000. In 2008, it was 5,000. 
I don't believe in golden ageism because I think one has to be very careful about rose tinted spectacles about the past. But what I can say is that the present is quite desperate, uh, concentrated obviously in a number of uh, war zones where we are working. But here's a second statistic, final one, um, about what's happening in Syria, which I think is interesting. Um, the number of internally displaced, in other words, internal refugees per person killed in Syria is 25 to one. Uh, the historic average since 1945 is five to one. So five times as many people are being expelled from their homes for, e for each person killed as in previous uh, conflicts. And as you probably know, 70% uh, of the victims of conflict are civilians. So this age of impunity seems to me to define the work or at least part of the work of the center that Mr. Kent has set up, or I'd argue, I'd hope uh, that it, this will receive sufficient priority. But to state the obvious and to pick up something that other speakers have said, the conflict is changing. Uh, someone might think that a, a center for conflict would be looking at conflicts between states, but actually conflicts between states, uh, hot conflicts, are very rare uh, today. What you see is conflicts within uh, states, conflicts with non-state actors as well as state actors, uh, conflicts with proxies and partners, not just uh, labeled players, conflicts that is urban. 85% of conflict in the world today is urban uh, conflict. A conflict that is protracted, you just think about Afghanistan, think about Somalia, think about uh, Syria, already nearly a 10-year conflict. Um, conflict which is diverse. I mean, everything from uh, proxy armies to youth militias to gang uh, warfare. And I'm afraid to say, finally, conflict which is contagious. Uh, I gave a speech at West Point in January before the COVID crisis and talked about those six new dimensions of conflict that I think call for change in military strategy. They call a change in humanitarian strategy. They also, frankly, and this really rolls the pitch for uh, Rosemary De Carlo, who's coming on after me, uh, it, it changes the game for diplomacy because the tools that were developed for interstate diplomacy are not adequate for intrastate conflict. Conflict within states needs different diplomatic tools than conflict uh, between states. And so as you, uh, my, my, I'm in the last of my five minutes, so I don't want to uh, go on, but the rollback against the age of impunity is gonna take leadership from countries that by their own constitutions are meant to be living by the rule of law and they're gonna to have to uh, lead by example. Uh, it's going to take coalitions because unless uh, governments and peoples are able to uh, establish coalitions against impunity across the public private divide, I was very struck by what Mr. Kent said about the need to line up governments, civil society, and the private sector to achieve change. Unless you build coalitions, we're not gonna roll back uh, impunity. We need new tools, thirdly, and we need clarity about what counts as success. We need to be a, we need a peace making program, not just a conflict program, if I may say so, uh, to this distinguished group. Uh, I can see on my computer that it's my five minutes. So I hope that contributes to the launch of this uh, seminar. Thank you very much indeed. Well, that's terrific. And I'm, I marvel at your restraint and actually observing the time. So I'm impressed by that and appreciate it. Thank you very much. Uh, now we're moving to Dean Kewar, uh, because in the more optimistic years, and even today, there's a lot of discussion that somehow the neighbors have the solution. And somehow regional organizations and arrangements, the sub-regional ones have the solution. And sometimes that may be true, but obviously it's a lot more complicated than that. And Jordan obviously has seen the best and the worst of the neighborhood. So Dina, if we can ask for you to comment on the possibilities for regional cooperation and what about the neighborhood? Thank you, Edward, and thank you to Marit and Mukhtar, and I wish you all the best for this uh, global uh, leadership program. And I'm very happy to be part of this fantastic panel. I know them all, so that's wonderful. If you look at the region in five minutes, that's not an easy task, but I'll just say a few words and maybe to promote the discussion. There is no uh, regional uh, engagement that is based on security, economic, and, and political that is uh, encompassing the whole region, being Arab or non-Arab. The closest we have is the Arab League that was founded in '45, and that we know has been part partially successful and, and on both economic and political, but not fully. Not a fault of its own, but we know that member states, if they're not committed and willing to do a change, no organization in the world uh, can do it alone. 
So what are the challenges that, that we have in the Middle East? First of all, we have different political structures between the countries, from monarch monarchies to other uh, ways of, of uh, governing. We have a difference in, in, in the economic situation between GDPs that go up to 200,000 per capita to 1,000 per capita, and therefore the economic uh, diversity between these countries is extremely uh, uh, complicated. We have different political agendas and with time uh, these agendas are becoming much more uh, uh, diverse, uh, yet the issues and, and problems uh, are, are uh, very much shared. And it's making uh, therefore any leadership hesitant in giving up the personal interest to something that's more regional, more uh, more uh, wide in, in, in this interest. There's also a dependency on foreign alliances. Depend here, for example, the dependencies we have on the United States, these countries make us look outwards more than trying to build more regional uh, solutions. And of course, um, there is a change in the architecture of power in our region. Um, years back, we could see that the uh, Egyptian, uh, Syrian, Iraqi, a uh, trilateral uh, presence in the Middle East set the foundation of a power structure in the Middle East. Right now we see non-Arab countries like Turkey, Iran and Israel uh, sort of playing the cards in, in our region. Of course, the Arab Spring the, it was not an easy uh, and, and the results we're seeing it. And David referred to the to many of the issues of, of the difficulty of uh, intra um, uh, state uh, uh, civil wars, uh, the difficulties of, of dealing with these wars in terms of refugees, displaced people, uh, the fate states, unless we solve the Syria, uh, Libya uh, situation, unless we give Iraq more power and presence to be able to stand back on its feet after the war, unless we stop the Yemen war, all these issues are, are difficult. We are also dealing with very uh, abstract issues as terrorism, um, that's in, being engaged all over the Arab world, and we've seen the horrors during the war. So, uh, of course, Jordan has been at the forefront of, of uh, you know, whether it's fighting the terrorist wars with the alliance, whether the refugee issues that we have, we have numbers that are amazing, at around 1.3 million. And in spite of all the help that we're getting from the international, it's not sufficient uh, to, to help us. Uh, stand on our feet, and now it's been 10 years. 10 years, there's a whole new generation in, in Jordan of refugees. So these issues are real issues that we have to deal with. So about, uh, from, from these issues and challenges that we have, we have uh, also two systems of economies. We have the economies of the Gulf states that are right now focused on the post-oil era, not that we left the oil era, but they're all looking at what is next, given the fluctuation of prices, given that uh, we need to move on to the next step. So um, ha what has happened in these last years? We've seen that sub-regional uh, groupings like the GCC has, has become much more stronger. And today we're seeing that even the rift that is uh, hitting the, uh, this group, this GCC, is maybe there are good signs of it uh, you know, going to some kind of reconciliation. But the GCC has become more because of the countries within have shared interests of what they see as the political uh, danger to their system and, and they share a lot of economic uh, similarities. Uh, we see that there are ad hoc uh, relations between countries depending on leaderships, uh, what they have in common, what they feel in common, uh, what is the, the problem of, of that moment, but, but these are not structured uh, um, uh, kind of arrangements. And beyond the regional arrangements, we see that the uh, outer boundary of our part of the world, meaning Europe, has become very much involved in our uh, regional uh, structures, whether the Barcelona uh, process, the European neighborhood uh, uh, policy, or the UPI, Union for the Mediterranean, that was uh, set a few years back by the French. So what, what we're trying to see is that the intra-air, uh, Arab states or regional uh, cooperation has not gone very far, but has gone through the European circle uh, to, to encompass some of these countries. The US has tried with the quiz uh, program that they had to uh, go towards encouraging peace uh, between the Arabs, the Palestinians, the Israelis by uh, supporting uh, uh, these quizzes uh, in the area. And they've helped Jordan a lot because our exports to the US have 
increase their wealth. So what do we need to agree to move forward? And this is probably where the most difficult part is, and, and I will stop after that. First of all, we have to accept on a political agenda in which we respect each other's concerns, all on the same line. No one concern should be more important than the other. And to try to be respectful for each other's uh, concerns and worries and work all together in the region. We need to address the ongoing wars, uh, not easy in one sentence, but we have failed states, we have to worry about Syria, because once we solve the Syrian issue, we can try to solve the uh, refugee displaced issues. Uh, we have to worry about Libya, because Libya is not only uh, a problem for the Libyans, but also for the regional countries and also for Europe. For, it's affecting the refugees, it's affecting the issues of terrorism, because right now, as, as much as we have journalists without borders, we have terrorists without borders. These terrorists are moving from one conflict to another according to what it's become a business. So this is something that we need to worry about. We need to worry about the ongoing wars, about building uh, countries like Iraq uh, making uh, a, a sort of solid structure that is uh, a, a good start for the other countries. We also need to uh, go beyond and think about issues that are very important that we never have the time to think about. Example, food security. It's a problem. We need to think about that. We need to stop. I always say in the, in the Middle East, we're always in a crisis mode. We never look ahead uh, towards um, what's coming. Water issues. Uh, how about youth? You know, youth is, is the one thing that keeps us together. It's the, uh, the uh, most, uh, uh, the population of the Middle East are youth with their issues. How about issues of drugs? We don't want to address that, but there is a lot of issues that are involved with drugs issues and, and other concerns. And for us to be able to put these uh, matters on the same level as, as the security issues, because they are at the end of the day affecting it. On the economic side, uh, side uh, right, our economies are not the same. It's very hard to put uh, GCC countries with Yemen. Uh, it's very hard to put our issues. With. But um, uh, it is important that we agree on some structural economic projects that are useful for both or all sizes of economies and that will help promote um, the economies uh, overall. By the way, uh, I failed to mention that, that the Palestinian-Israeli uh, issue is, is one of the issues that we need to, to address because I mentioned Syria, I mentioned Libya, I mentioned uh, Yemen, but uh, obviously that's uh, not for lack of interest, but that's, it, it comes uh, for a Jordanian, this is part of the issues that for us is, is taken for granted. So, and, 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 and going back to the economic issues, we also need to um, give a lot of importance on increasing interdependency uh, with industries, with issues in agriculture and trade, and move uh, uh, forward into what would be one day a, a more interdependent uh, security. And uh, keep remembering that at the end of the day, what matters most, unfortunately, which is the least uh, given attention to, is the, the people of the region, whether it's the, it's the youth that I spoke about or whether the people who are in conflict areas. And for that, the, the triangle you all spoke about is very important to set uh, the issues that concern the business, the economic, and the civil society for them to work together. I hope I did enough in five minutes, <laughs> but hard to, hard to go faster. Thank you very much. Now that's terrific. Uh, you covered uh, a lot of issues. And obviously, if you're Jordan, they're immediate issues. They're not theoretical issues. So I really appreciate that. Thank you very much. Uh, now let me turn to Rosemary DiCarlo. Uh, Rosemary has the challenge of trying to provide answers to so many of these questions because most of them end up on her desk at one point or another. And of course, the UN is involved in peace operations and peace uh, diplomacy in much of the world. So uh, we're particularly interested, Rosemary, in any thoughts you might have about efforts that have been made or that could be made to sort of build that golden triangle, to work on the relationships uh, between the private sector, uh, civil society, and the uh, governments and intergovernmental organizations. And obviously there's been a lot of work at the UN on civil society, but I must say, from my experience, uh, the private sector is still a little bit left behind in that calculus. Uh, so Rosemary, please, you have the floor. 
Well, thank you very much, Ed, and congratulations to Dean Jano and Mr. Kent for launching this important program. Um, let me just start out with stressing one thing that the United Nations is not the preserve of states alone. Uh, and it's clear from the opening words of the UN Charter, we the peoples. Uh, there are formal structures and processes in the organization to facilitate the engagement of civil society, uh, even if civil society has always had to be vigilant to preserve them. Uh, it's clear civil, so civil society organizations have played an important role in furthering UN's objectives. Uh, for example, they've assisted with immunization campaigns, they've helped shape recent landmark agreements on sustainable development and climate change. Uh, but the UN's relationship with civil society really has been more evident in the humanitarian, environmental, and human rights fields. This isn't really surprising until relatively recently, uh, mediation and uh, conflict resolution meant leaders from opposing sides, almost always men, sitting around a table with a UN or other mediator, also usually a man. Uh, and as conflicts have become increasingly complex and difficult to resolve, uh, ending and recovering from war had to be, become a lot more inclusive if it was to be durable. Uh, as we see, many of today's conflicts feature a deadly mix of fragmented actors and political interests. Um, there's a clear recognition today that mediation has to move beyond political and military elites and more effectively include efforts at the local level uh, and different groups to help build peace from the ground up. I just wanna mention that Secretary General Guterres, uh, when he first came into office, called for a surge in diplomacy for peace. And he really wanted to translate the recognition uh, of the need to include more individuals, groups in peacemaking uh, into UN action. Uh, so he was clear that the UN had to adjust and transform the way it does conflict prevention, mediation, and peace building. Um, and in response to his call, we've increased our engagement in local mediation initiatives, for example. Uh, we've given direct technical support uh, to UN and non-UN partners to help address local conflicts or establish linkages between these local groups and national level mediation processes. And what we found is that local government representatives, youth, women's groups, NGOs, uh, traditional or religious authorities offer potential entry points. I'll give you an example in the Central African Republic, uh, UN mediators worked with women traders and religious leaders who had uh, connections across communities. And these relationships helped facilitate understandings to disarm groups, uh, dismantle checkpoints, all of this that paved the way for a broader agreement. Um, we're striving to engage more youth directly in peace efforts. In Iraq, for example, we've implemented a series of projects to strengthen youth participation in local decision-making processes. And in the Horn of Africa, we're supporting youth engagement in intercommunal dialogues and other peace-building activities. Now, uh, Secretary General also, at the beginning of his tenure, decided that the organization needed some major reform, including uh, the UN's peace and security pillar, of which my department is a part of. Um, the aim was to make our pillar more coherent, nimble, and effective. And as part of this reform, he highlighted the importance of partnerships, including with civil society. Uh, he reiterated the imperative of pursuing and deepening the inclusion of women in young people in peace efforts. Uh, we know, for example, that in the early stages of peace talks, both young and more experienced women are often a driving force in achieving inclusive participation uh, and securing gender provisions in peace agreements. Um, it's why in Afghanistan and Sudan, our missions are working to promote inclusion of women in local and national peace processes. And it's also why in Iraq, Syria, and Yemen, our envoys have established women's advisory boards to ensure that women's voices are heard. Our mission in Somalia is partnering with UN, advi and UN advisory boards uh, that include young women and men to strengthen young people's involvement in political processes and peace building. Um, on the private sector, our partnership with technology companies is an example of the contribution that private sector can make to the work of mediation and conflict resolution. Um, in the context of COVID-19, these partnerships have become increasingly more important. 
Uh, let me give you a couple of examples. Uh, in order to include diverse and often marginalized voices, uh, we supported large scale virtual consultations with 1500 Libyans in October on the ongoing political process in Libya that is shepherded by the UN. Uh, similarly, we supported large scale virtual consultations in June uh, with over 500 Yemenis to get a sense of public views on a proposed nationwide ceasefire as well as key humanitarian and economic measures. These consultations were powered by an artificial intelligence tune that, tool that we developed along with tech partners in academia. Now, there are initiatives at the UN, for example, the Global Compact and the UN Office for Partnerships that do work with the private sector. A lot of their concerns uh, were concerns, sustainable development, labor, corporate social responsibility, uh, but cooperation with the private sector on peace and security issues needs to be explored much further. Um, I think there is an opportunity to deepen our engagement with the private sector in sustaining peace. Uh, obviously, I, I think Mr. Kent probably has views on this as well. To going, going forward, again, what do we need to do to strengthen the role of civil society to make sure that there are uh, groups that are marginalized are included, that women are included, that youth are included in making decisions on their future, working a lot more at the local level and helping to diffuse tensions and building to an eventual peace agreement or um, uh, peace process. Uh, also uh, to work, I think, more cooperatively with the private sector and looking at things, particularly new threats, new threats uh, that can either harm fragile societies or certainly affect uh, countries that are already in conflict. I hope I answered your questions. Thank you. No, that's terrific. I really appreciate it. There's a lot of ground to cover and you did it very aptly. And uh, we're very pleased to see that you're doing all of this work as someone with your background has this job at the UN makes a big difference. Uh, we have some time now for Q&A, not a lot, but we have a few minutes. And a couple of questions came in that I think are worth talking about. Uh, one of them in particular, I thought, cut across to all these areas. And since we've had a little bit of a historical background here, I think it's worth posing. And that is, what about the future? Uh, we talked about the past a great deal. We talked about how things change from one decade to the next, but there's no reason to assume that the next decade is going to look this way or that. We're moving into the third decade of this century, are we going to have one that looks like the first, like the second, or like something completely different? Uh, we know we don't project these things on any kind of uh, rigid basis, but what do we think the future will hold and what can we do to make a difference with that? Would anyone like to comment on that? Any of the panelists? If, if it is true that uh, there, there are now anywhere near 120 conflicts running in the world, I think the UN has really to uh, reorganize itself to see how you are going to address uh, definitely not all of these uh, 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 conflicts at once, but to see how uh, we do business. Uh, you know, it, I think that we, you know, as, as I, I said earlier, we have a tendency to throw people at problems. Um, you know, one of the, uh, I mean, the, one of the worst time I spent was my time, my six months in Iraq. But I think that we did uh, with five, we were five of us. And we did as well or better than if we were 200. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, the ICRC is, is, is an extremely good example of how you can do, uh, how, can, how much you can do with uh, very well chosen few people. Uh, I have never seen the ICRC with any any more than 20 people, or much less most of the time. 
Uh, and, you know, I mean, when we were in Afghanistan, there were 700 of us, 700 UN people, not only, not only UNAMA, but other, other organizations. That's, that, that was far too many, far too many. So there is, there is, I think, a lot of uh, uh, thinking that needs to be, uh, uh, to be you know, developed uh, into uh, a better use of uh, resources than we do uh, than we do for the moment. Terrific. Would others like to comment on this one? Well, may I say something? Please, please. Yeah. I, I think also just uh, because of the amount of conflicts that exist and because of the complexities of these co conflicts and because we see that they are um, not, uh, more and more within rather than between, uh, it is very important that for the regional structure and regional areas to step up and become more dependent uh, on themselves in, in trying to advance, at least to lead these, these structures uh, with the UN. We saw that in Africa. I mean, in the recent years, the African Union has stepped up a lot in this process, has tried so much to do peacekeeping in Africa and so on. So this idea of trying all the time to put everything on the back of, of the UN, which is overloaded with, with issues and problems or on, on big powers is, is not uh, enough nowadays. That's, that's what I think. No, that's very helpful. Please, Rosemary. I agree with what Dina has said. I think, first of all, there have to be, we have to understand where the UN can make a difference, where a regional organization can make a difference, or where certain countries can make a difference. That, that's one. And um, really um, divide uh, uh, the, the, the issues so that uh, we are supporting each other, but not necessarily always in the lead. Uh, I also think that it is the importance of partnerships is really key. Uh, and even quiet and silent support to certain efforts um, that may be either by the UN or regional organization because um, there is so much happening. Uh, and we have seen many times where a regional organization can frankly do the work far better than the UN can, or even a few countries or individuals. Oh, very helpful. And I think something that uh, Dina mentioned in her earlier presentation, the role of sub-regional organizations. And I think the mention of Africa, yes, the AU has done a lot, but a lot of it has been, burden has been carried by sub-regional groups, ECOWAS uh, and others. And so I think it's important to not only think of a region, particularly when they have such a huge con continent and so, so diverse uh, as Africa is but think of the sub-regional level as well. Um, I have one final question and then I'll turn it back to Merritt. And that is, does anyone have any suggestion about what we should teach? In a way, everything that you've been saying is about things that we ought to be teaching. But one of the things we want with the new program is to teach things that maybe are not standard curriculum. The assumption is that the old ways of doing things still have some validity, but we've entered an era where we have to start looking at things with fresh eyes. So if anyone has any final thoughts on what we should be teaching, uh, now's a good time to say it and then we'll close after that. Maybe I please. can make a suggestion. Oh, David, please. I would say to you, don't be afraid of politics. Uh, the issues that we're talking about involve some technical questions. There's all sorts of technocratic issues that are raised. But don't be afraid of politics. I don't mean party politics. I mean global politics. Issues of sovereignty. Uh, issues of global power. Issues of respect for the law. Issues of accountability. These are not just policy questions. They are political questions. And if you are afraid of the politics, then you'll never get to the guts either of the origins of conflict or of the difficulties and the potential of resolving them. And sometimes when I hear about public policy schools, I know you're not exactly a public policy school, I, I hear a thing around the interplay between politics and policy. And I think that as an independent academic institution, 
the answer is not to avoid politics, it's to expose your students to different ways of thinking about politics. And what we see in many parts of the world is at the moment is open politics under attack. And one can, all, one can think of uh, different examples uh, of this. But um, if this school is to be a beacon of anything, it seems to me it needs to be a beacon of thought about how policy and politics in the domain of conflict studies uh, fit together. No, that's very well made. And uh, I must say, my experience who's taught, someone who's taught about the UN for a lot of years, I find some of my students want to go into the UN or get involved in the UN as if it's an alternative to politics. When of course, it's hard to think of anybody, and I see Rosemary is smiling, anybody that's more political than the UN. Without the member states, there would be no UN. So you're absolutely right with that. Uh, Sam, did I see your hand up or? Yeah, I was just gonna say on the existential issues, I think having classes with using fully information technology to connect uh, countries like young students in Russia, young students in China, young students in, in uh, United States, the nuclear states, so that they can begin to understand there are mutual existential interests. I think the same thing applies on the biological side. Um, but I also would believe it would apply to conflict resolution between two countries where you get the young people studying the facts together and trying to come up with a set of facts, not necessarily agreeing on opinions, but at least have a common set of facts. We're losing the common denominator of facts. Um, everybody wants their own set of facts these days and they pretty much have them. And I think we've got to find a way to flip that around on the information that is so readily available. Well, that's terrific, uh, Sam. And I must say that uh, those who are younger, some of our younger students who never went through the Cold War, who never saw that tension and that danger, miss something because you learn lessons from difficult experience and God knows that was a difficult experience. And your contributions to resolving many of those questions uh, have had a real lasting difference. So thank you everybody. Uh, terrific group, as we knew it would be. Uh, you all contributed a great deal. Uh, this will be available online uh, at our website and uh, we will be doing a summary of the conversation. So how many highlights we can capture, I think remains to be seen, but uh, you've all been doing wonderful work and we really appreciate you taking the time to be with us. And let me turn it to Merritt uh, for the final word. Oh, well, I simply want to say that I wish we had more time because I want to hear from each of you. So please don't hesitate to send, you, send us your thoughts because we are in a building phase for this program. We need your ideas and everything that's been said here has been enormously consequential. So thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we hope that we can collaborate, learn from you and involve you going forward, uh, everyone who's on this program. And thank you all for attending this afternoon, this uh, inaugural launch of the Kent program. Thank you very much. Good afternoon and all best wishes. Thank you. Thank you.